Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special event here in the Forum of Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Europe in Hanover Messe 2023, uh, because we have the Norwegian-German seminar now, and uh, we would like to give you an introduction in the mission of Norwegian and German politics developing a bilateral hydrogen alliance. Um, as you probably know, last year, the Federal Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Action, Dr. Robert Habeck, and Prime Minister Jonas Gastöre, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Jan Christian Westre, and Minister of Petroleum and Energy, Terje Osland, have a joint declaration agreed to further strengthen the close relationship and partnership between Germany and Norway in the areas of energy and climate policy and industrial transformation. So the Norwegian-German declaration is aligned with the EU Repower Plan uh, to develop import capacities of 10 million ton hydrogen per year by 2030. In this regard, a deepened political and industrial partnership with Lower Saxony will be important to realize a full-scale value chain between Norway and Germany. Today at the Norwegian-German seminar, we want to present and discuss the ambition of Norwegian and German politics, developing a bilateral hydrogen alliance and on hydrogen export or import, and Norwegian industry's contributions. We want to look at the industry's expectations for cooperation achievements so far and next urgent steps in the transition from vision to reality. So. Um, this, having this said, I would like to uh, yield the floor for John Hansen, the Minister Councillor at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Berlin, for the introduction to this Norwegian German seminar. Mr. Hansen. Thank you very much. Uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised by the disco music introduction. Very fascinating. Dean Rich House Minister Olaf Lies uh, and State Secretary uh, Bjelland Eriksen. Uh, I'm honored to welcome you on behalf of Team Norway to the Norwegian-German seminar on hydrogen and fuel cells. It's encouraging to see so many representatives from Norway and Germany's energy and industry sector here today. Hydrogen is becoming increasingly important for a sustainable future as it offers a promising solution for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and providing clean, reliable energy. For certain parts of the industry and transport sector, there is no other solution. We need more energy and the increased demand must be covered by more renewable sources. The current energy situation is challenging, but it's also a golden opportunity for the future if we act on it together. The Russian aggression war, aggression war in Ukraine has shown that Europe needs to stand together and it's as important as ever to have reliable partners. Germany is Norway's most important partner in Europe, politically and economically. We share the same values and face the same reality. This relationship is especially evident within the energy sector. Norway is today a reliable energy partner for Germany, and we aim to be so also in a future based on more renewables. Norway and Germany have decided to further strengthen our close partnership on energy, climate policy, and industrial transformation. This was agreed when Chancellor Scholz and Prime Minister Stöder met in Berlin in January last year. The German-Norwegian Energy and Industry Dialogue was born. The goal is to create new green industries and jobs, as well as strengthening common energy security. The intent is to ensure a large-scale supply of hydrogen with the necessary infrastructure from Norway to Germany by 2030. A feasibility study on the pipeline is in the making right now and will be finalized in a couple of months. Norway wants to actively contribute to the development of a hydrogen market in Germany and the EU. We recognize that there are substantial challenges ahead when building up value chains and a functioning European hydrogen market. However, we will together with Germany seek to accelerate the necessary framework and an infrastructure for a functioning European hydrogen market. 
to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement, we believe that hydrogen and carbon capture and storage both will be a part of the solution. Lower Saxony is strategically located for receiving, storing, and further distribution of hydrogen in the future, as they already have been for natural gas for many years, and recently also for LNG with the new floating, may I say, Norwegian terminals. With its harbors and existing infrastructure, Nida Saxon will most probably develop into an import and distribution, distribution hub for clean energy. The close collaboration between Niedersachsen and Norway therefore plays a key role in the energy transition for both our countries. I want to thank you all for joining us here today, and we are delighted to have you here, and we hope you will enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, John. And I love the way you said Niedersachsen, <laughs> very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the State Secretary at, of the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy here with us, uh, Andreas Bjelland Eriksson, and he will tell us about the Norwegian government's policies to contribute to a coherent value chain for hydrogen in Europe. Would you please enter the stage and give us the speech? Thank you, Andreas. Thank you so much, dear Minister Lees, dear ladies and gentlemen. As was already mentioned, Germany is Norwegian's, Norway, Norway's largest business partner and energy is at the core of our partnership. We have been long-term energy partners already and never has the importance of that partnership been clearer than the last year. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the way that Russia has uh, utilized gas as a strategic weapon against European solidarity uh, with Ukraine, we have been able to work together to be able to ensure that we meet the energy crisis with sufficient measures, ensuring the stability of our energy systems to the best extent possible. I have been extremely impressed of how Norwegian energy companies have worked to increase gas production by 10% the last year. And I have also been extremely impressed by the measures taken here in Germany. Who would have thought that it was possible to build out an LNG terminal in Wilhelmshaven in just a couple of months? Now, the energy crisis backdrop is a grave one. And nevertheless, I see a lot of excited faces here uh, at this event today. And the reason for that is obviously that while the backdrop with the energy crisis is grave, it is also an immense opportunity that we need to grasp to bring forward the energy transition that has been needed already for many years. When you look at me, you still, I hope, see a relatively young man, and I hope it continues that way for the next couple of years at least. But as long as I have been doing politics, we have been talking a lot on the energy transition, but I think we have to be honest that some of the measures and perhaps also some of the urgency have been lacking. Now, the immense speed up that we have seen in the work on the transition just the last year has been really impressive. And if we can work on this, we really can move the work on creating a value chain for hydrogen going forward faster. We need to do a lot of things at the same time. It has been very fruitful, the dialogues that we we've had with various parts of the German authorities the last year. And I very much welcome the joint declaration that was signed between Habeck uh, and his Norwegian counterparts in January, and the concrete work we now are doing on the joint feasibility study, looking into what kind of infrastructure could be feasible between Germany and Norway to create an integrated hydrogen market. These are the 
examples of the work that we need more of going forward. We have moved the debate from a debate of everyone loves hydrogen and uh, it's very great to the difficult debate on what are the concrete issues that we need to tackle to do this in practice. And the challenging thing about that is now we really have to tackle everything at once. We have to build supply, we have to build infrastructure, and we have to build demand. And our work on creating a full chain value chain for CCS in Norway shows that if we are to solve the chicken and egg problem, we cannot do one at a time, we have to lift it all at the same time. And that is really the difficult job that we need to tackle right now. I do not know completely how the hydrogen value chain will look in the future, and probably no one else here will as well. But I am quite certain of the following. If we are to reach our climate targets, if we are to build up this value chain for hydrogen now, we need every building block available in the energy system. That means blue hydrogen in the short to medium term, at least as a part of the solution. And it means a gradually phasing in of more and more green hydrogen, while we at the same time ramp up renewable electricity production and make sure that we decarbonize our entire energy system. That is how we need to work from the government side, facilitating this, and then from the business side to do this in practice, to find the commercially viable projects uh, and to implement the government strategies and the government support mechanism. We have already started in one way in the sense that we have been producing hydrogen in, in Norway based on German technology for more than 100 years already. But we have also started in the terms that uh, now in Rogaland, the county in Norway where I am from, the world first hydrogen ferry is in operation, filled with hydrogen supplied by Germany. Now we're probably going to turn that value chain around, produce hydrogen, both blue and green from Norway, and transport that to industrial and other customers here in Germany. It's not happening fast enough, but the last year we have really made the snowball go faster and faster forward, and we will continue on that work. We have a lot of responsibilities on the government side. We need to make sure that the support mechanisms are strengthened and improved. We need to make sure that the energy authorities have the resources that they need to speed up processes to be able to work in parallel. But that it's also your responsibility as businesses to work actively finding good projects and to bring this collaboration forward so that we can make sure that we work together and build on the momentum to create a full-scale value chain for hydrogen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, State Secretary. And in my opinion, it is an advantage that you're so young, you know, because you have to tackle so many problems and uh, <laughs> yeah, there's still a few things to do for you. And uh, so we're happy that you have all the time and, and effort to do so very much. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, importing green hydrogen from Norway is the one thing, but building up a value chain in northern Germany is another thing. So uh, I'm very happy to have here with us uh, the Minister of Economic Affairs of Lower Saxony, Olaf Lies, who will give us an insight in developing a hydrogen value chain in northern Germany. Minister Lies, here's your stage. <clears throat> Thank you very much. First of all, a warm welcome to you here in Hanover, dear Secretary Eriksson and dear Mr. Councillor Hansen. Uh, thank you for our uh, contact. Thank you for the possibility to make this uh, conversation together, this discussion together for a really important project. Ladies and gentlemen, we all we are feeling the effects of climate change more and more frequently. Floods, droughts, storms and periods of heat are 
also increasing occurring in Germany. It is all the more urgent to replace fossil fuels with climate-friendly, CO2-free, energy, energy sources. And we heard it, Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year and the resulting gas bottleneck made it dramatically clear to us that we need to speed up the energy transition significantly. As a zero carbon and energy source, hydrogen has the potential to radically transform our energy system and make an important contribution to combating climate change, particularly in sectors where it is difficult to rely on renewable energy, energy resources. We started today with the Salzgitter steel to tr transform it into a green steel with, in the future, I hope, with hydrogen, maybe hydrogen from Norway, that might be a good solution. As a sector coupling technology, a comprehensive hydrogen economy offers considerable economic and industrial policy, policy potential for Germany and can at the same time contribute to achieving climate targets. Compared to other regions, northern Germany has unique location advantages for establishing a hydrogen economy. These advantages have led to intensive cooperation between the northern German states and the common northern German uh, and the common northern German hydrogen strategy. In recent years, we have seen successful pilot projects supporting the use of hydrogen in various sectors, including transport, power generation and industrial production. Lower Saxony companies are developing climate-friendly hydrogen technologies and applications together with suppliers, energy producers and research institutes. With a hydrogen-powered refuse collection vehicle from Faun or the fuel cell train from Alstom, successful products for a hydrogen economy have already been developed and brought to the market in Lower Saxony, which have attracted great international attention. In order to support the ramp up of the hydrogen economy in Lower Saxony, the state government decided last year to provide over 800 million, million euros in state funds to support IPSA projects, important projects of common European interest. That was the beginning today with Salzgitter Steel. It is an almost investment of more than 2 billion euros and it's uh, founded with uh, state, and, uh, state money and uh, federal money from almost 1 billion euro. And I think that is important to start up with such, an, uh, um, such a perspective for green steel or green chemical products or anything else. To make the importance of northern Germany and Lower Saxony in the development of hydrogen economy clear once again, almost 50% of the approximately 60 IPSA projects in Germany are in the five northern German federal states located. We must be aware that we still have a long way to go to use the full potential of hydrogen. The cost of hydrogen production needs to be further reduced. Hydrogen infrastructure needs to be further expanded in order to stimulate hydrogen demand and facilitate hydrogen transport and storage. International cooperation and the exchange of experiences play a crucial role uh, in the process. Regulatory incentives and investment in research and development are needed to support hydrogen infrastructure, expansion and technology development. Countries need to work closely together to set common goals and standards and synchronized hydrogen development. The state of Lower Saxony is therefore actively seeking exchange with international partners. Norway and the countries bordering the North Sea play a special role in this. Just this afternoon, Norway and Lower Saxony companies exchange views on potential and cooperation in the field of hydrogen. Tomorrow we will do this with the Scottish delegation. And we are also building international activities at the level of the northern German federal state. With the High Five initiative, we are advertising worldwide at trade fairs conferences for cooperation with northern Germany. It's an, it is important to ensure that the benefits of hydrogen are accessible to all and that hydrogen is embedded in sustainable development. In the long term, Germany will continue to be dependent 
on the import of energy sources. Only then no longer fossil fuels, but re regenerative hydrogen or its derivates. I therefore welcome the recent conclude agreement between the federal government and Norway on a hydrogen pipeline. We will work on to ensure that the pipeline lands in Lower Saxony. I think that might be a important start for other projects. In long term, Germany will continue to be depend on import of energy sources. Um, lower, sorry, Lower Saxony. However, the more renewable energy we generate ourselves, the less dependent we become on imports from potentially critical, critical regions of the world. That will be important for all in Europe, I think. So it's a European project to be independent. Low Saxony is the pioneer for the worldwide transforming, transformation process. The energy turnaround in Germany can only succeed with our technologies, the ideas, and the commitment of Lower Saxony and our excellent infrastructure. This key position is known worldwide and opens up new markets for our companies. I'm optimistic that together we can master these challenges. But working together and sharing experience internationally and with Norway in particular, we can ensure that hydrogen realizes its full potential as a clean and as a renewable energy source. Thank you for being able to take part in this Norwegian-German exchange. And I'm delighted that I will be visiting Norway in May together with the Prime Minister of Lower Saxony, Stefan Weil, and around 30 companies in the energy industry to discuss this topic. So thank you that it was possible, it is possible to just discuss it here, and thank you um, yeah, thank for you this Minister possibility. Thank you, Minister This is your applause. And just have a seat here on the right-hand side. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming now to the panel discussion. I would like also to ask the State Secretary uh, here to me on stage and also uh, um, Inge Björk Talnes Willemsen, General Secretary, Norwegian Hydrogen Forum, as well as Werner Diewald, Chairman of the Board of the German Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. Please have a seat. Have a drink of water. There's one missing for you. Oh, no. did, you didn't want okay. one? Okay, very good. Perfect. <laughs> <your> one. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we, are, we are talking about where are we on the path from the hydrogen vision to business and what are the next steps? So um, I would like to ask you, Mr. Ericsson, you already told us what, what uh, obstacle has to be taken and, and what uh, things have to be tackled. Um, I would like to know the joint declaration between Germany and Norway last year. How much impact does it have on Norwegian politics, economics, is it one thing under others or is it an important thing for you? I mean, it's really important for us to have concrete cooperation on how we move uh, forward. The energy partnership that we have with Germany already is our most important uh, partnership. And we have been very clear that we want to continue being a trustworthy long-term energy partner for Europe and for Germany in particular. So building on that, we need concrete uh, groundwork to be done within the field of hydrogen, for example, to do that in practice. But I think the most important thing that uh, the joint declaration facilitates, and which is also an important part of the joint feasibility study, is a concrete look at what needs to be done on the infrastructure side for this to be put in place but also what needs to be done from the industry side, both uh, on the supply side, producing hydrogen uh, uh, from sources in Norway, uh, and then on, on the demand side here in Germany, what needs to be done on the industrial side here in Germany as well. Let's start with the infrastructure uh, um, side. Uh, um, Inge Björk, uh, one of the first joint projects is a feasibility study on the development of a hydrogen pipeline by 2030. Um, there are already gas pipelines coming from Norway to, to Germany. Will you rededicate one of them or, uh, to a hydrogen pipeline or will you build a complete new one? Thank you for that, Uli. And, and first, I would like to say a huge thank you to both uh, the German and the Norwegian government for having this joint declaration and, so, so to speak, going forward to, sh to saying very clearly to the industry that you, you are serious. 
you really would like to have a stronger cooperation that makes it possible for Norway to, as you said, still be a very important supplier of energy and to reduce emissions. And I have to say, Andreas, that I really liked. I heard the word faster and speed up. So thank you for that. Mm. That's, I think that's very promising. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But you're right, Oli. We are, uh, there is a feasibility study uh, in regards to both uh, blending of hydrogen into the natural gas. Uh, the result so far says that we can blend in 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they are still working on how much you can blend it. And also to, to reuse uh, the pipelines itself so you can... Uh, push 100% uh, hydrogen into existing pipelines. But I, I do believe that our members are very clear on that point that we would like to prefer to have a new pipeline. <laughs> and this <laughs> probably has something to do with the natural gas prices. Uh, but of course, for, from our point of view, uh, it's going to be really exciting uh, to see the results, hopefully in June. Uh, I think they're on time. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And, and we hope that uh, the answers will make it possible for the 13 companies that are joining to say, yes, we are willing to go to the next step and that we have the, the governments in both countries with us on our side. Building a complete new pipeline will take a lot of years. Huh? Before 2030, it will not happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think actually the ambition is that if we are building a pipeline, which I hope we do, it will be operational in 2030. And in terms of pipeline, that is pretty fast, yes. actually. So uh, yeah, right. I know in that. In terms Jasper, of climate change, I would yeah. say. Yes. <laughs> exactly, but we, we are in a hurry. We are, indeed. Uh, Minister Lees, uh, you just pointed out Germany and Lower Saxony desperately needs to develop a, a hydro value chain. Uh, in in uh, Lower Saxony, we have, for instance, Salzgitter, who needs a lot of hydrogen, green hydrogen. Uh, but you also pointed out that tomorrow you have uh, another talk with Scottish delegation. Yeah. Uh, so Germany, of course, and Lower Saxony, of course, has other partners as well. What is the exact role that Norway will play in the politics of Lower Saxony? So Norway at the moment is a very important partner for the energy solutions, uh, natural gas, as I think almost 40% of, of the use in, in Germany. So it, it, it was our very important partner also in the critical side in, in the last year. But in the future, we, we have to uh, make the turnaround from the fossil gas into, into the uh, CO2 free gas. And you, you said there are three different ways. You can blend it, so it's a first step. So 20% of all our natural gas is CO2 free. So this is a big step in a short time without changing infrastructure. But the second step is to import uh, hydrogen from Norway. And the first discussion you, you made it is we need a CO2 free gas. Not important what is the color of the gas. You don't care about blue hydrogen. No, uh, blue hydrogen <laughs> is okay because we want climate protection and blue hydrogen is a, is a very important uh, uh, solution for, for climate protection. So next step, we want to import uh, blue hydrogen, first of all, from Norway, maybe by ship, maybe by a new pipeline, or maybe first by ship and after, ship and after then by pipeline. But there is another step. We, we import natural gas, we, we have an industry, cement industry, steel industry, where we produce CO2. And what is the solution? One of the solutions is to transport CO2 also to Norway. So Norway could be our strategic partner also to storage CO2. We and need a CO2 partner. pipeline back to we, Norway. <laughs> uh, normally we need two pipelines. Yes, we need a pipeline for hydrogen and we need a pipeline for CO2. It's, a, it's not an easy discussion, but I think if we want to be really, really, really quick to to, uh, to, uh, to develop uh, strategies for climate protection. Right. I think CO2 storage is one of the solutions. Mr. Diewald, we all know cooperation is a nice thing and we've heard cooperation is going on, and, uh, um, but investments will only be made when legal certainty is uh, safe. Uh, we've been waiting quite some time for the Delegated Act to clarify the definition of renewable hydrogen. We are still waiting for the approval of the European Parliament. Uh, what is the state of the art at the moment? And can you say if Norwegian hydrogen will be acknowledged as low carbon? Good question. So I don't know exactly if we have really the right uh, legal framework, the Delegated Act, if it comes in June or not in June, it's open. It's a little bit, perhaps, 
it's not really important because we can make our own regulations in Germany, so we are not really 100% depending on the European decision. We have to make it in our national framework. We have to create a national framework which, would, uh, which should be, of course, in line with the European regulation. But I think the dispute around the European regulation is really so small that we can make our own regulation now. So and you just don't care? Mode. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in good hope that we go forward, that we have in June the right framework so that we get a de demand, a secure demand. That is the most important thing. And then we can start to import or we get the right investment decisions from the companies. In the moment, we talk a lot, but there are not hard facts on the table to, to, to make the investments. Very good. Uh, Mr. Eriksson, you, you did a very good job when our uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs was in Norway because he came back and said, well, CCS, carbon capture and storage, is not a big problem anymore. <laughs> you must have briefed him quite, quite good indeed. So uh, how much will, will be the part of blue hydrogen that you will export uh, to Germany? I mean, just to put the energy numbers into context, because I think that's important. Uh, we export about 1,250 terawatt hours of energy through gas today. We export about 10 terawatt hours of electricity. So we have a lot of projects also in Norway for ramping up renewable electricity production. I think there is a strong case from gradually more and more uh, green hydrogen as well, also from Norway. And we have some advantages with our hydro-based uh, system, which makes it very flexible. But in the short run, the big access to energy from Norway is from gas. Uh, and then you can, as the minister said very uh, clearly and, and in a very, very pointly manner, you can sort of decide if you want that to be carbon free or not. And that's a decision that we can discuss. But I think we need to cut all emissions that we can as soon as possible. Yep. And we need to utilize every building block that we have. And I mean, what has been really shown the last year is that energy is no, no longer a, resources, a resource that is abundant. And then I should state it somewhat differ, uh, differently because going forward, carbon-free energy will not be an abundant resource. That is something that we need to use in a good manner, and then we need to utilize every building block that we Mr. have. Mr. Diewald, you don't seem so very happy about this, uh, what uh, the State Secretary just said. Uh, full understanding that Norway tried to, to sell a long time the natural gas as carbon-free gas or whatever. Go over the fair and look what happens here. Here are electrolyzer companies. You have fuel cell companies, you are not CCS companies. So if I look on the German industry, on the German industry place and the European power of industry, I would look more on the focus of green hydrogen. It's more in our interest, the costs are not higher. And every time the answer, but yeah, it's not so fast. I don't know the big capacities to produce blue hydrogen. I don't see it. We have to discuss it. We, have to find in Germany especially a negotiation with the public and we know what happens if we see what happens each day on the streets and so on and so on. In the end, we see the acceptance in Germany and we have to accept. We can't say, yeah, we make it far away from here. I think that would be the, the really a worst message to the people who are fight. It's nearly a fight on the streets. So I think we need a clear message. Yes, we make renewable energy because the public want it and we need the acceptance. If not, we, we, perhaps we come the first meters very, very fast and then we stop immediately and we get a backbone, a backbone and then we lost a lot of time and we have not the time to lose it. You would like to, to comment on that and, and just to, to add to it, you have a lot of hydroelectric power in Norway, don't you? Absolutely, but uh, uh, first of all, I think it's important to, to separate the two issues somewhat because there are a lot of hard to abate sectors where CCS will be needed as part of the solution. That, uh, so, so the cooperation on, on CCS will be strong and we have the potential to store 1,500 times the total Norwegian CO2 emissions under the Norwegian continental shelf. So I'm, I'm sure that we will have a strong collaboration there. And then just on the perspective on the power generation, in Norway, 
the average household consumes about 17,000 kilowatt hours of <laughs> electricity. We consume a lot of electricity already today. And we have one of the most electrified societies in the world. And regardless of that, we need to ramp up renewable electricity generation by almost 40% within 2030. In Germany, you will have to do even more because you're going to decarbonize the existing power system, which is 100% renewable in Norway already today. I support green hydrogen. I hope that it succeeds, and I'm sure that it will over time. But on the step there, we need to utilize also the existing energy and the uh, uh, infrastructure that we have. And that is the case with the volumes for, for blue hydrogen. It, it's not about extending the fossil fuel age. It, it is, it's about utilizing every available building block and resource to be able to decarbonize as fast as possible. And to be honest, it's not the question between the different colors of hydrogen. Uh, it is the, the question between gray or other hydrogen. And gray hydrogen is, is uh, made by, by steam reforming, but it's much cheaper than any other, even blue or green. So how will we tackle this problem, Ingeborg? That is a very good question. Thank you, Willy. And, and you're quite right, because in a perfect world, uh, CO2 emission would be very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, today it is too cheap to pollute. So until we are able to price CO2 correctly, we need to have some support schemes that that function as a risk relief because we just conducted uh, an overview now uh, about all the hydrogen and ammonia projects in Norway and they are in total 126. That was last week, could be one more now. A lot of projects are not public yet, so I know there, the number is really higher, but 51 of those projects are uh, production of green hydrogen and most of them are green hydrogen uh, but in terms of volumes, uh, I think there are four blue, but they are sort of in 2030 perspective, the blue uh, comes from more than the volume, but in the amount of the green project is, is a lot higher. But I believe that all these companies now have the will to invest because they are driven to contribute to, to reducing the CO2 and they also see the business potential in this. Uh, but the problem is that the producers now are very uncertain about will there be a demand, how large is demand, and at what price am I able to sell my product? And at the other side, the end users are also uncertain whether the producer will be able to produce enough hydrogen, and what do I have to pay? If I'm going to use it as a fuel on my ship, for instance, what will the cost be? So that is why uh, that our members say that now it's, it's crucial in addition to the investment support that the Norwegian government have been great and, and given to several projects, we need uh, a risk relief uh, to close that gap in the beginning. And that's why we say we need contracts for difference and we need it now. And uh, um, Andreas, Norway has a minority government, as I know, but you uh, have agreed with the opposition to uh, uh, introduce contracts for different subsidies for hydrogen. Uh, when will they be implemented? I mean, what, what we've done now uh, is that we have uh, set out the study uh, which look at the future support mechanisms for, for hydrogen in Norway. I, I think both in Norway and in many other countries, the challenges is not per se the amount of resources that exist within mm. the total amount of support schemes uh, today. It's how they are utilized. Uh, and that is what we look very concretely now. That report will be delivered uh, before the summer. And then when we receive that, we will look at that very closely and, uh, and, and utilize that to work on how this can, uh, can be set up going forward. Because I think it's important that uh, we take all the necessary steps from the government side. And that is more than money. It should be stated very clearly. It's also regulations and it's also other issues, uh, uh, not only the support mechanisms but make sure that we have the right, uh, right amount of support mechanisms and the correct support me mechanisms in place to be able to facilitate this going forward. And how does this fit together, Mr. Diewald, with the H2 Global program, uh, which is also a kind of, uh, well, uh, contracts for difference? So, so do they fit together or, or is it for other applications? 
I think it fits together. It's, it's nearly the same system. It's a little bit another mechanism, but in the end, it, it um, closes a different... The buyer who will pay the highest price, price uh, will get the hydrogen, and yeah. the producer with the lowest price will get yeah. the, um, the contract. Yeah, and I think it's very close to the market. So it, it's a f and we see it, the experience from the renewable energy law is very well. We see that the prices for the electrolyzers goes, or for the wind turbines, now for the electrolyzers goes down. So I think that is uh, the advantage if you compare it with an, an, an CAPEX subsidy program, there's not really pressure to, to bring cheap electrolyzers in the market and to optimize the business model of what you have. But under the auction, if you try to win it, or you want to win it, you have to optimize your business model, you have to buy a cheap electrolyzer, you have to optimize everything, and then you have the op option to win. And I think that is the market design, what we've seen in Germany, what, what is our basic for our economic success. And so I think that is really a good, good, really good system. It's available immediately, and that is the same point. We need now solutions, we need now a business case, and we have to stop the discussion, we have to act now. And Minister Lees, as long as Norway pays for contracts for difference, Germany doesn't have to. Would you say so? <laughs> that, that might be a way. Um, and, and Norway is much richer than Germany, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I think the, the interesting way, we discussed what, it is, what is necessary. So is it possible to get a price for a product that is a climate neutral product? That will be the future. So climate protection must be a business case. So it will not work otherwise. So, so that's, I think, the idea. And if it, if it works, so you are, you are able to pay for, for climate neutral uh, power uh, as gas or electrical power much more than if it will not work. And I think we, we need, not only in Europe, but in Europe, but uh, I think we need it worldwide, uh, a business model that makes it possible that is. Uh, um, climate protection will be, will be really a business case and that will be the, the, the driver. And as Ingeborg already said, in a perfect word, carbon would be very expensive, you know, ex 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 yeah. carbon. But uh, you, as a federal minister, you don't have much influence on the price of carbon, have you? No, but uh, um, um, I think uh, the discussion what will happen is a, is a political discussion because there is there's one positive effect. We say it, it will be interesting to use a CO2-free energy, and I will pay more for that. But you have also the people living in Germany. They are paying for their energy, they are paying for their heat, and something like that. They are paying for their mobility. So it's a little bit difficult. We, we, want, to make it to a bit for, for, we want to make a business case for the industry, for production, but we, are, uh, we also uh, need to save or, or uh, secure people for, for a higher price of CO2. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. It's not an easy answer you can give at this question. Uh, Mr. Niemann, I would like to come back once again to H2 Global because the first tranche of H2 Global has just released and it's, uh, it's done for the purchase of green hydrogen derivatives, namely green ammonia, methanol or kerosene. Are you expecting pipeline hydrogen will be considered in the future? I hope so, because I think that is a future for the European Union, that is a future for Germany, that is a chance to not to destroy the value change which you see in the chemical sector or the steel sector. So if we import really the energy, the renewable energy over gas to Germany, so that's the best option to hold the value chains in our country, in the European Union. So if you import suddenly this uh, oxygen-reduced uh, uh, iron ox. There's a danger that the next step of production will be go to the same place where it will be done. So if you import the derivatives or ammonia, ammonia byproduct is uh, at blue. So if we don't or if we don't produce ammonia in European Union, we have no at blue. So we import it also. So I think there's only two examples where we have to be careful. And I think this cooperation with this, I call it pipeline countries, is the best option to create a strong European Union, a powerful European Union. And I think in the next, we have learned in the last 24, 36 months with Corona, this war in Ukraine and so on, how important it is to have, to, uh, to have a resilient economic. 
Minister Lees, uh, we in, in uh, Lower Saxony, we have a lot of wind, as, as we can feel every day. Uh, sometimes <laughs> we even have sun. <laughs> yes, and, a lot uh, of sun. Could, could, <laughs> right. Nearly every day. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly every day, yeah. The sun is there. Maybe some, some clouds are before it. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, could we build up a decentralized production of green hydrogen on our own, you know, like using the heat by, by producing it of the electrolyzers and making uh, it very uh, uh, effective, uh, avoiding an expensive infrastructure. Sorry to say that, you know, like, like a long pipeline. Uh, why don't we build up an own infrastructure, an own hydrogen infrastructure in Lower Saxony? I think the, the answer is we need both. We need an, uh, our own infrastructure. And very quickly, because it's a, it's a really interesting market, we decided that there should be 10 gigawatt in 2030. That's a lot if you see the project at the moment. But there will be, I think, in the beginning centralized uh, in, the, in, in these this areas where a lot of energy is. And a lot of energy uh, you will find in the northern side of Germany, the coast side, because there are the points where the offshore wind energy will will uh, be uh, usable. Um, but well, there will maybe other sites, I think we, we have to use uh, to look where it is uh, from, from, the, from the useful way, the best place, not where we want an, an electrolyzer where we make it sense to build it. But this is only one step because we need a lot of green electrical power. Uh, now, at the moment, on, on Saturday we decided, or we, uh, it, it was the, 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 uh, the, the end of the decision, uh, nuclear power plants were shut down. So in 2030, coal plants should be shut down. So we need a lot of renewable energy for having enough electrical power. And over that, we need more electrical green energy to produce uh, um, uh, hydrogen. So we need both. We need a lot of hydrogen import on the import side by ship, by pipeline, and we need uh, a clearly a uh, way to produce our own uh, um, uh, um, hydrogen because we have in the future much more electrical power with wind turbines and solar plants than we need. And so if we want to storage that, en that energy, we have to, to transform it into hydrogen. We can storage hydrogen and we can use hydrogen clear gas plants to, to, to uh, produce electricity. But, but the reality is, at the moment, in the, even in, especially in northern Germany, Lower Saxony, a lot of wind uh, turbines yes. have to be switched off because we can't use... It's just too much renewables, you know? You believe we will... F uh, it's, uh, we have not enough grids. Yeah, the that's right. Is, that's the point. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's a little so, bit of a variant problem, but okay. <laughs> I learned just a little so, bit. <laughs> so what my, my question is, you believe we will uh, quicker build up in... Uh, gas pipeline to Norway, then to, uh, to a grid to, to Bavaria? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it's not the solution. It's not the solution. We need also both. We, we, we have to build a lot of grids. It's, it's a really a problem. If you see it at my home site in, in, uh, in the coast site in Wilhelmshaven, uh, at this moment there are uh, t uh, three H HGE grids uh, um, uh, that are built that also uh, DC, uh, DC grids and AC grids and, and all at the same time. So there, there will be uh, realized a lot of projects. But if you see the whole energy need of Germany in the several uh, parts, you see we need more. We have a plan for 2045. 2045, there is climate protection, no CO2 emission. And we know... Uh, how many energy we need in 2045. So we can see what is able to produce at electrical power with renewable energies, what is possible to directly produce hydrogen and what is necessary to import. I think it is the mathematical solution we can see. Andreas, maybe last question to you. Uh, um, the, the pipeline will not only bring a lot of revenue for, for Norway for, for the green hydrogen or blue whatsoever, uh, but it will also give, you know, like in... Uh, an uh, um, economical shift for your industry, don't you think so? Because a lot of industry will grow up in, in Norway then to produce uh, this hydrogen, to, to perform it, to, to, bring, uh, to bring new solutions uh, for this. So this is also an economic booster for you, isn't it? I mean, obviously, 
it's important for us that we transition over time as an energy country. If we want to be a big energy country and a trustworthy long-term supplier for, for Germany, we have to build up new business opportunities within new areas, uh, being that hydrogen, being that CCS. But then I think the most important thing right now is, first and foremost, to understand how important it is that energy systems are integrated also in the future. Why were we able to handle the energy crisis that we've been faced with the last year? Well, it was due to the fact that Germany wasn't an energy island. Yeah. Norway wasn't an energy island. We worked together, yeah. uh, and that is why we have been able to meet the current energy crisis. This is how we need to work going forward as well, being able to cooperate, use the advantages of the different energy systems to be able to play on each other advantages to the benefit of the climate crisis and, mm -hmm. and the, cut emission, uh, the emission cuts that we need going forward. And then, just finally, the other part of having integrated energy uh, uh, markets is, and systems is also that the disadvantages is sh being shared by everyone. I mean, Norwegian electricity prices have never been higher than the last year. And I'm stating that just because when we now look into how we set up the infrastructure, how we set up the future economies, green economies, uh, decarbonized economies, it's important that we not all uh, only discuss the, the value generation and the benefits. We need also to discuss the disadvantages in yes. a good way so that we're able to construct a system that can last over time because uh, we cannot just spark this with contracts for difference and then hope that everything will, will be great. We need to set up something that can be a long-term solution being beneficial to the climate, but also being beneficial to Norwegian households, German industries, etc., yeah. etc. Et and this is how we need to work on. And also Norwegian industry, probably. And uh, this is what we were going to talk uh, in the next round. For so far, I would like to thank you very much for being here, dear panel, and uh, you, dear audience, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Innovation Norway is a state-owned company and a national development bank, and Norway's most important instrument for innovation and development of Norwegian enterprises and industry. Michel Duarte, Senior Advisor at Innovation Norway, will now tell us what is needed and how can we contribute. Team Norway is in Germany for you. Michel, where are you? You're ready? Here's your stage. Go ahead. Thank you, Uli. I'm ready and I would like to call for the video, please. This is a video of one minute and a half to summarize all the discussions that we have here today. And the idea is to show uh, the past, 
the present and the ambitions of the future for the Norwegian industry in terms of hydrogen. So I would like to say that this vision of the future will only be realized through two things, teamwork and collaboration. When it comes to teamwork, I would like to address that Innovation Norway, under the coordination of the Embassy uh, of Norway in Berlin, uh, together with our partners from Team Norway, uh, the Norwegian Hydrogen Forum, Norwegian Energy Partners, the Norwegian Clusters, uh, the German Norwegian Chamber of Commerce, we are here to work as a team, as a task force, to bridge opportunities and create the best arenas for business discussions. When it comes to the collaboration, we believe that Germany and Norway are in this, the moment uh, to become the front runners in the decarbonization and the green transition to come. So uh, please count on Team Norway as a task force to support your business development efforts, and we will be here to leverage uh, your efforts. So having said that, I would like to call Uli back to the stage to introduce the industry panel of this day. Thank you so much. Thank Uli. you very much, Michelle. Give her a big hand, please. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I have, have to tell you that it's, it's Michelle and her team that made it happen uh, that we have such a close relationship between Norway and Lower Saxony at the moment. She, she did a lot of work to, to make this happen. Uh, so thank you also for that, Michelle, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we go on to uh, another panel debate and we will talk about what is needed to fulfill political targets and how can the industry contribute. So I would like to see some uh, participants from the industry here on stage. Uh, may I ask uh, uh, Ms. Wiebeke Rasmussen here, Torsten Herbert, Jonas Meyer and Matthias Enger on stage, please. Okay, I have learned in the pre-talks that there are 817 hydrogen projects existing in Norway. Uh, so I will now talk with representatives from the Norwegian industry, hydrogen industry. Uh, and next to me, I would like to welcome um, uh, Ms. Wiebeke Rasmussen, Senior Vice President, Product Manager and Certification at Yara Clean Ammonia. Good to have you here. I would like to welcome Torsten Herbert, Director for Market Development and Public Affairs at Nell Hydrogen. Good to have you here. And also Jonas Meyer, the CEO of Gen2 Energy. And uh, opposite of me, Matthias Enger, Operations at Tico 2030. Please welcome them with a nice applause, please. <laughs> Jonas, let's uh, start with you. We were talking about the, the pipeline from Norway to provide Germany with green hydrogen. You are producing the green hydrogen in Norway, do you? Yes, that's correct, I think. How do you do that? We, we couldn't have dreamt of a better introduction, I would say, from the politicians. Although they can promise you the world, but we are the ones that are supposed to do the grunt work, right? So what we do in Gent Energy is that we build large-scale production facilities for green hydrogen based on electrolysis. Uh, but we also the development of the value chain. We talked about shift, we talked about potential pipelines. And actually in December last year, we were very pleased to announce that we had signed a memorandum of understanding with a large state-owned German company to import all of the volumes for the first facility. So hopefully, although we should be a bit of a caution when it comes to timeline in this business, if everything goes as planned, within three years or so, we have green hydrogen being transported from Norway to Germany and maybe even arriving here at, at uh, maybe Wilhelmshaven area. So that's what we try to but, do. But as I understood, there is not a project uh, ready yet. It's, you're still planning, are you? Yeah, yeah, it's not in production. No, there is no production of the triple digit megawatt scale uh, in Europe as far as I know today. So uh, you can ask my colleague in Nell here about it, which has some experience for the last almost 100 years or so on the hydrogen production side, not but personally. not personally, no. <laughs> uh, but yes, we've been doing it in Norway. So. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, good. so uh, if you want some on timeline, uh, 
all of the site that we work with is detailed zoning plan is complete within the municipality and everything. So we're trying to sort of stage this so it's ready for construction within a year. Okay, within a year you start pro producing the the hydrogen. Probably your your plan uh, plants will be next to hydroelectric power plants, won't they? The, your your electrolytes will, yeah, well, will be well, there. Norway only has wind power and hydropower for power generation for the entire grid. So okay. if you are in Norway, yes, you're next to it. <laughs> Enough of it. So how much do you plan for 2030? How much ah, will we, we have a one gigawatt capacity uh, target. And just to illustrate a little bit, because we talked with the state secretary here saying you will import 10 million tons of hydrogen by 2030. We try to come up with a solution for you guys, the first 100 megawatt, that's large scale, but that's roughly a bit less than 15,000 tons that can come from that first facility. So it's not by far near enough. And even if we go 10 times that within 2030, we're not just a small, small fraction of what is being imported in Europe. Torsten, for green hydrogen, you need electricity from renewable uh, sources and you need electrolyzers, obviously. Uh, quite a lot of electrolyzers, frankly said. Um, how quick can you ramp up your production? That's basically exactly the challenge we have. Uh, so theoretically, we are like pioneers in a lot of things. Uh, one thing is we have the first fully automated uh, electrolyzer electrode factory in Norway, in Herea. Uh, so we have an automated production footprint. So theoretically, this is a copy-paste product, if you want that can be uh, uh, reproduced in Herrea, where we are doing it now. So the uh, facility in Herrea gives us the space for like three more of those production lines, which will add up to a capacity of two gigawatt electrolyzer manufacturing capacity per year. Uh, and in general, like uh, coming back to your question, theoretically we can do it fast because we have the automation concept ready. Uh, but we are also still a small company um, with now around 600 people overall. Roughly That's like a bit, small, a, bit, a bit more, a bit more than 200 in Norway. Um, so um, it's still like a balance act that we have to take with the market not ready yet. Um, and like big investments that we are facing when it comes to the ramp up. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And um, we are also working on that in, in, in Brussels um, when it comes to how can we kind of ease this process for the manufacturers. Um, uh, but we, maybe we can come back to that uh, later. Indeed, yeah, Thorsten. But the, the, the ramp up has to be made because as many people do not know, most electrolyzers nowadays are made by hand, you know, which is uh, very much time consuming and also error prone. That can't go on like that. But without any contracts, you still have to build up a, a, an own a gigafactory uh, and uh, no customers already. So, so you're really hoping for good customers, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just to stress it again, we are pioneers in a lot of things and we. Um, have the only fully automated uh, factory in place with our own money. So it, it wasn't funded in any way, uh, not nationally. Uh, not investors' on the, money as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, that's the game, right? Um, so therefore, um, yeah, this, this needs to be highlighted. So it's our own like investments without support as we speak. Um, and, and that's a big challenge. Um, and, and I really uh, hope it works out yeah. very well indeed in the end. Vivike, Yara is a manufacturer and supplier of chemicals and industrial gases, such as urea, nitrates, and ammonia. Tell me, everybody's talking about ammonia. Why is ammonia such a good hydrogen carrier? Yes, um, Yara is, is one of the biggest fertilizer producers in the world, and definitely also today the biggest shipper and trader of ammonia and the benefit with ammonia is it doesn't need to be cooled down to minus 250 uh, to be transported but so to minus 32 isn't it yes okay <laughs> so and it is it is an existing business it's transported 20 million tons of ammonia is actually transported around the world today so we don't need to build that infrastructure it needs to scale 
but it is an existing business. And the infrastructure is also all over the world because every, all over the world we need uh, fertilizers. So the harbors already have the the silos for for ammonia. It's already it's already there. Yes, I think uh, fertilizer is the uh, second largest user in the world of hydrogen today. So it's it's quite a big industry. Uh, it's uh, lots of terminals, ships that transport ammonia worldwide, and ammonia as as a the grey ammonia today is a commodity worldwide. Right, and there's a lot of grey ammonia in the world, and you could produce a lot of green hydrogen and trans uh, export your ammonia to, to like, like say, Germany or, or Europe, and we don't even have to, to reform it because we need it anyway for fertilizers. Yes, you need the, the ammonia for so, so why should we buy the, buy, uh, build a pipeline? Because hydrogen for other users, of course. Uh, I don't think you can use ammonia for a lot of the but uses that you would have for hydrogen. But I think you can... You can use all the hydrogen for ammonia, couldn't we? We could do, yes. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> maybe we decide that. I was, was astonished because I heard yesterday from the Namibia project and they also want to expo import their, their green hydrogen uh, via uh, ammonia. And they told me, well, we can build up like, like uh, uh, a thousand uh, 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 square kilometers uh, of, of, of green hydrogen uh, um, uh, renewables. And, and we still uh, don't need to reform it back to hydrogen because we need all that green ammonia. So there's a large demand that I wanted to point of, out. Of course, today, I think, as, as was said in the last panel debate also, we don't know where, of course, the industry is going and the volumes we need in the different uh, derivatives going forward. But, of course, it is possible already today to ship and trade. So, so if you have ammonia and you can import ammonia to Europe, uh, you can crack it back to hydrogen. And, and of course, that is a way of starting and scaling an industry before you have the hydrogen backbone in place. Matthias, uh, TECO 2030 accelerates the green transition in the maritime sector by delivering technology that helps ships to reduce the environmental and climate impacts. What is this technology? Is it fuel cells, exhaust gas cleaning, and uh, carbon capture and storage on board? Yes, so we are mainly focusing today on the PEM fuel technology, which we are developing with AVL, the Austrian uh, technology developer, which has about 20 years of experience within fuel cells. Uh, and we are sitting here today with three companies who are producing the fuel of tomorrow. And with our fuel cell, you can use all of the company's products. Can you hold the microphone a little bit closer yes, so that I can hear you better. You can use all of the three companies' uh, fuel, but with uh, Torsten and Jonas, we can go directly from hydrogen and to the, into the fuel cell. But to go with Yara, you need a pretreatment. So the PEM fuel technology is dependent on green hydrogen to have the best, or to work. Um, and today we are establishing a factory up in northern part of Norway, Narvik, uh, not far away from where Jonas are planning his factory, where by 2030 we will produce 1.6 gigawatts of worth of PEM fuel cells. And as you said, with carbon capture technology and exhaust gas tre uh, cleaning treatments, uh, that is also projects we are looking into. But today, it's the PEM fuel cell which is our number one priority. Well, let's come back to the fuel cells, because for fuel cells for maritime application, I can only imagine auxiliary power units uh, when, when the ship is in harbor. Uh, what could that be? It's just what you said. Uh, for larger ships, we are seeing uh, port operations, uh, hotel loads, and sailing in and out of port. And, but we also see one of the first clients we started talking to is a Dutch company who is uh, a part of the Ipsa project called Green Hydrogen at the Blue Danube, where they will be producing 80,000 tons of green hydrogen each year in Romania, and then will transport it along the Danube. And they were first looking into battery technology to power their tugs. But as they quickly saw is that the batteries are way too heavy. And at the shallowest, the Danube is only 1.2 meters shallow, which is why PEM fuel cell technology will be a crucial uh, technology for inland waterways. 
Matthias, when we have a lot of hydrogen tr produced in Norway, in Australia, Chile, Namibia, wherever in the world, we will probably at one stage not only use ammonia, which is a good idea, I, I have to admit, but also liquefied hydrogen. I know now liquefied gas, LNG, is transported by uh, um, by by uh, large uh, ships, and they use the boil off gas to uh, to to run the ships there. Is not it also a good idea for liquefied hydrogen to use the boil off hydrogen for fuel cells? Absolutely, that's a <laughs> it's quite simple Thank answer. <laughs> yes, it's a smart solution. Uh, you already have the hydrogen on board uh, to fuel the, your fuel cells, uh, but for the project we are. Mainly working on today, uh, compromised uh, hydrogen is the biggest uh, demand for the time being. Jonas, tell me, most of the hydroelectric uh, power is far in the north, uh, um, and so you have to transport the green hydrogen south in one way or the other. What are you planning? Ammonia, liquid hydrogen, compressed hydrogen? Oh, uh, as a company, we're allowed to do everything. Uh, but the first facility is looking into compressed hydrogen. And the primary reason for that is that it has the highest TRL level, so it's possible to do today. Uh, you always have some issues with all kinds of technology, basically. But it's also the way that you can arrive at the port, for example, in Germany, at the lowest cost. And we, we heard a lot about cost here as well. It's not just to subsidize, and then when you subsidize, go away, the business go away. You need to be cost competitive all the time. That's always the problem, you know, with subsidized. I, I agree with that, yes. Yeah. So, so in, in another interesting thing what you plan to do is also to use the heat of the electrolyzers. And you said uh, for farming or for fish farming. Uh, how will you do that? It's interesting. Yes, um, well, Northern Norway is not the hottest part of Europe, so to say. Uh, so uh, we're, we're using it for different parts, actually. We also try to use the spillover heat to heat up all of the storage area around the facility so that you have an ice-free storage area and an ice-free port so that you can do your operations 24-7 and you can minimize the cost on snow plowing, etc. that you have a lot of in North Norway. Obviously, um, I think when you talk about green hydrogen, what everyone talks about is the efficiency, right? And you say efficiency loss on the electrolyzers, etc. No, it's not efficiency loss. It's just that you get it out as heat. You don't get it out as hydrogen or power. So if you can utilize heat, that heat, you increase the efficiency, basically, and you minimize the loss of energy. So that's why we try to look into it. And in motion, there is also a distributed heat network that exists today that is run on pellets that has CO2 emissions. And you can just connect it to the facility less than a kilometer away, and then you can use that spillover heat, basically. You know, what impresses me about your business case is that I really believe in you because you've been an equity, uh, equity analyst before. So you will only do business that really counts out, doesn't it, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's You're true. not a green dreamer. So uh, say, yeah, so yeah. But you, you then assume that all of my analysis was correct back in the days. I'm not sure if that was the case. <laughs> But I was very positive to Nell, and we, we had a lot of good business together with, with Nell. And I think what we can say is that 10 years ago, there was no talk about hydrogen. You wouldn't even have one stand on this mess, for example. Um, so it's getting a lot more attention, and it's getting throughout the value chain, all the way from the power producers to the end consumers and the fuel cell and the technology developer. So that market is coming, and I think um, Andrew Forrest, if you know the guy, uh, has been quite vocal about this. It's never been such an industry that you can develop without having an offtake agreement because everything will come in place. There's such a huge push politically to get this working. So, uh, yes, I'm still optimistic if that's what your question is. <laughs> Torsten, I, um, I believe uh, it's, it's already clear that Norway will not only export hydrogen, but it will also export technology probably. Don't you think so? Thanks a lot for the question. It seems like as if we were prepared. <laughs> Um, I was not. I'm just <laughs> that's what comes into my mind. I have uh, this slides only for for some air. <laughs> no, no, that, that that's 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 a very good point. And and uh, also since we have uh, you still here, state secretary, um, I think it's also something I always make people aware of that uh, it's not about at Norway as kind of an energy country, um, and but here and you see that the uh, a joint booth uh, over there that. There are also a lot of technology companies uh, and also leading technology companies um, also pointing to Hexagon just, just across uh, the, the joint booth. Uh, leading technology companies from Norway. Uh, so I think this is a big opportunity, 
not only to export molecules, but also to export, also to export uh, technology. And I'm trying to get not tired of, of, of highlighting that. Um, yeah, and that would also mean, uh, on the other side, support for the technology companies uh, in different ways. So I said so far no support from Norway for the, um, uh, our first uh, manufacturing uh, line, um, but uh, that can only improve, I guess. But, but um, Thorsten, you can only export something that really works in your own country. And, and if I come to the second uh, business uh, part of, of Nell, which are hydrogen defueling stations, Norway only has five of them. So it's going to be hard to, to sell that technology, don't you think? I mean, that's again... Um, sorry that I look in, in your direction again, but <laughs> it's, it's again like, uh, yeah political ambition, where do we want to go? Um, and uh, I think in maritime, Norway is quite clear with like a ambitious target on zero emission in the maritime sector. That's where we also see the first uh, green hydrogen uh, projects funded by, 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 uh, by Norway also. Um, but yeah, if, uh, looking into the cities, living myself in a Norwegian city, seeing the distribution trucks, seeing also, and that's quite easy, you know, that there's not a lot of players uh, on the like logistical side, right? So uh, if you get those on board and if you like succeed in like generating a critical mass uh, with regards for to, to vehicles and, and demand uh, on, the, on the logistical side, I think the stations will come automatically. Um, so it, it's really about setting the right ambitions not only in the maritime sector, but also in the heavy duty transport uh, sector. Um, and that's what we are still looking forward to, maybe in the, in the upcoming uh, like hydrogen strategy paper. Wiebeke, um, what do you think? Could we also use ammonia as a fuel for cars or trucks? Do you, could you imagine that? I, th I think ammonia is, is foreseen to be more um, shipping and long-haul DC shipping. Um, it's too, too uh, toxic, or what is it, the reason? No, no, it's, it's not the toxicity. It's, it's more about the weight and the, the volumes and things that you need. So uh, that's, that's the reason. Well, it's foreseen... It doesn't smell very good, does it? No, you will smell it. But also, that is the advantage that we have the best instrument of, of actually detecting it long before it actually is dangerous for us. So you, you believe uh, ammonia will be a liquid fuel for, for large cargo ships? Yes. It's, it's not methanol in your eyes. Why not? I, I think the, if the massive shift in, in the energy or a full sector that we are against we need everything and i think that that it will be different uses and different times because also we see that starting now with the methanol but i think longer term ammonia is also going to be built into and and be an important fuel for shipping uh, matthias just just tell me if you use ammonia on ships do you can you burn it directly or do you have to extract the hydrogen first in a pump fuel cell, you're not able to use ammonia directly. But Certainly it, not in a fuel cell, yes. No. But if you, for example, have a solid oxide fuel cell, there you can use ammonia directly. Ah, okay. So, so what kind of fuel cells are you, you building? We have a PEM. You PEM have a PEM, cell. okay. Low temperature. <laughs> the, the pure one, okay. Uh, um, one more thing you should tell me about carbon capture systems, because I think that's, that's quite interesting. You collect the carbon during the journey and, and dump it at the deepest point of the ocean, or what, what is it? We have been looking to, in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can either, as you mentioned now, uh, store it down sea, or you can also, I, I, I don't know the chemistry in it, but you can reuse it somehow on board and make an e-fuel out of it. Uh, but uh, for us at the moment, carbon capture isn't something we spend that much time into. Uh, Too much to do with fuel cells. Exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good to hear, indeed, yes. 
to all of you, the last question, and because we're running out of time, what is needed most at the moment to fulfill political targets, and how can industry contribute? Would you start, Matthias? I think all parts of the value chain needs to work together and um, push, to, push through, and we will get there somehow. And we just have, just have to walk the road and build, take it from there, basically. Jonas, what is your opinion? What is needed most at the moment? I, I think I'll go back to the introduction, basically. We can do what the politicians uh, promise you. Uh, but what I think is that there is a lot of development going on on the shipping side of hydrogen. We're currently covering all of the costs ourselves. And obviously, once you solve that solution, we won't share it if we do all the costs. But obviously, if people are willing to share the cost and the development costs, and looking a little, bit, a little bit on the politicians again, let's develop it together, all of the companies, so it can benefit everyone that wants to use this kind of technology going forward. Trost, what is your opinion? Yeah, I, I, mean, I would, I would maybe um, like add to that, and and like on the like regulatory funding side of things. So. We have, a, I think, a huge opportunity with the things happening in Brussels uh, at the moment, with the like, kind of uh, relaxation of the state aid guidelines for key climate technologies and the electrolyzers, fuel cells, for example, are part of it. So there is a huge opportunity to actually utilize the freedom the Commission is giving us, and it's, like it's also applying for Norway um, as for the rest of uh, like the ordinary member states, so it all applies also for the economic area. Um, and, and we need to utilize that opportunity uh, for, and we mentioned it before, to kind of leverage uh, the, the opportunity uh, for the technology companies in Norway, uh, really making use of this state aid relaxation. Um, what can we do to like, really point the right support to the right applications? and to the manufacturers, the technology manufacturers. I think that's a, a large opportunity we have. And the relaxation so far is valid until 2025. So we have to make up smart solutions very fast. But the opportunity is there. Very good. Vivike, would you like to join something, to, to add something? I think I think the three gentlemen here has summed up quite a lot of the needs that we but I, I think I would summarize it in three things we need renewable electricity we need renewables we need predictability to make investment decisions we need to know what the regulations legislations is going to be and we need incentives both on the production side and the offtake side a very nice wrap up of the, our conversation here on stage. Would like to thank you very much for being here. To all of you, I would like to thank you for your attention. Please give them a big hand, a big applause. <laughs> and the last word of this Norwegian German seminar will have uh, John Hansen, Minister Councillor. Uh, at the Royal Norwegian Embassy. He opened this seminar and he will close it again. So, uh, John, happy to have you here on stage again. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think it's about time to close the seminar now. It's been a long day for most of us. And our train to, to, to Hamburg is cancelled, so we have to find another way to get there. Uh, it has been a very interesting discussion, I, I think. Um, I don't have any really, really smart summing up uh, statements, except that I think there is a, a real political will to move forward in a cooperation between Norway and Germany when it comes to hydrogen and renewable energy, and that we will need to go through several phases to get to the final solution with green hydrogen and 100% and, and renewable uh, energy, energy supply. Um, I think it's definitely needed that uh, the big locomotives, the big industry companies um, stands up and start to lead the way towards this uh, renewable uh, future and, and to, to invest and to engage together with authorities to move ahead. 
I think also definitely there are uh, a need for support, not only on the regulatory side, but also on funding uh, from states. Uh, that could be uh, contracts for difference, or it could be other instruments, but it's going to be needed, um, and it's going to be needed fast to move beyond this threshold we are actually standing at now. And I think the, the, when we, we manage to move towards uh, a functioning hydrogen market, there will be a, a big fan of new technologies and new also smaller companies that will profit from this, not only the climate itself. But it's, uh, it's definitely a need for a, con uh, 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 a structured approach to the whole thing. And uh, no one, not one state, not one company or several companies can take the bill alone or the investment alone. This is going has to be a, a, a joint venture. Um, I also think that the, the framework that we have now from the political statements from Mr. Habeck and Mr. Stöder from January this year gives us a direction and it, it gives us a floor to stand on when we take this process further on into the future. So a closer cooperation, higher speed to reach common goals is actually what is needed. And on that happy note, I'm saying thank you to all of you for listening. I think it has been very, very interesting. Thank you very much to the moderator. You've been brilliant. Thank you, John. And the, and, and the audience is beautiful. It really is. And we would <laughs> like to give you something back, dear audience, because we would like to invite you to a reception just over there at the Norwegian Pavilion. Uh, we have a social event now starting right now. So all of you are very much invited to join us at the social event there. I can already see some nice wine, beer, and maybe some snacks will be there too. So meet you all over there. Thank you very much once again for staying here for your attention. It was a pleasure having this Norwegian-German seminar. Thanks.